I want to speak tonight on restoring confidence and renewing joy. Um, it'll take me a little while to get this message out. It's taken me 39 years to learn this. And I'm believing God with all my heart that it's going to be a blessing to you tonight. And it will restore our confidence and it will, by God's grace, renew our joy. Luke chapter 2, please, if you'll turn there with me. And we're going to start there. You might want to take your notebook because I'm going to have to go fast. I have a lot of scripture. I'm going to have to get through it tonight. And anybody in a rush? Are we going anywhere? All right. Okay. Not that it's going to make a difference anyway. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to speak this. Lord Jesus Christ, we are your church. We are your ministers. We are your ambassadors. All of us, whether we are behind a pulpit or in a nursery, we are ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've called us, Lord, to be your ambassadors in all the world, everywhere we go, and to preach this great gospel to every person that we meet. Father God, would you help us to realign our lives again with the great story that you've entrusted to us and the experience through our relationship with you. If we've strayed to the left or to the right, if we've lost confidence because of it, if our joy somehow got buried in the myriad of religious activity we can get involved in, if we don't look like the original church and we've so strayed, God, we don't even look like a credible copy anymore, would you help us, Lord? We understand that you will not condemn us. We understand that you have justified us. You love us. With a love so deep, we can't understand it. Knowing that, Lord, we invite you to speak to each of our hearts. Lord, we're not looking to escape your word. We're not looking to have you pat us on the back. We're looking, Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to honor you and represent you with power in our generation. We're looking to be that standard you raise that pushes back the darkness in this time and brings a multitude out of dar darkness into the life and light that you've promised to give them. And so, God, I thank you. Overshadow the frailty of this human vessel. Let your word flow through me tonight. And God, touch every heart. Touch our hearts and give us the grace to hear. And Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 2, restoring confidence and renewing joy. Beginning at verse 10. Then verse 11, then 13 and 14. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. And so this is the gospel. This is the New Testament introduction, may I say, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Good tidings, great joy to all people. That's the standard. It should never be any different. When you and I stand in a pulpit, when we preach, teach, publish, defend the gospel of Jesus Christ, it should always be good news. It should bring great joy to the suffering heart. It should give light to those who are in darkness. It should give freedom to those who are imprisoned, healing to those that are bruised and bound, sight to those that can't see their way out of their dilemma, hope for those that are too weak to feel that their life means, has any meaning or matter. Here's the reason, for unto you, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, Verse 13 says, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill towards men. This incredible declaration broke open the heavens. It's, it's as if angels in heaven were leaning on the curtain that separates heaven from the earth and suddenly just broke through and couldn't contain themselves. And they, they had to speak about something that was so marvelous, it was so powerful, it was so great, it was so wonderful, it was such good news that only God could have initiated this. They, the, out of their mouths, they, the first thing was glory to God for what he has done. Now we on earth, of course, those at that time, they, they could have no way of understanding the greatness of this moment, the incredible greatness of this moment. That a planet called Earth that was at war with God, even though it didn't know it, was now being invited to peace with God. And the God whose hand justly should be stretched out in judgment was now stretching out his hand in goodwill. In other words, wanting to be reconnected, wanting a new relationship with humankind. What an incredible message. What an incredible moment. Now we ask ourselves the question, why was this such good news? And wasn't there already a religious system in place? 
And what was wrong with it that needed it to be replaced with something else? If there already was a system, if there already was a temple, if there already were sacrifices being offered, if people felt they found a measure of right standing with God through it, so why then? Why then does God have to break through the heavens? Why does he have to send his son? Why do the angels break through the canopy? Why is this good news? And why should it bring joy to people's hearts? You know, sometimes we get in this, the wrong idea that religion should be sorrowful. And the sorrier you look, the holier you are. But yet that's not the way it was introduced to humankind in the New Testament. It was a religion, a relationship of great joy and of great peace. Now, in order to answer the question, we have to go back to the beginning, beginning in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 5. Now, this is the sin nature of humankind. Satan came to Adam and Eve in the garden, and here's what he said. He said initially to Eve, but generally speaking to both of them. God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. This is the inherent sin nature of humankind. It's the desire to live independently from God and to become in ourselves as judges or gods, as another translation might say, or that means judges of what is good and evil. In other words, the devil came to Adam and Eve and says, look at me, I've not suffered any harm. I'm thinking independently from God. And if you choose to think independently from God, you're going to have a greater depth perception than you now have. Now you're just living as a, in obedience to everything he has said, but if you operate outside of the parameters of his word, you'll be just like he is. You'll be as God is. And you'll have this knowledge given to you of good and evil. And of course, it wasn't an apple that got the human race into trouble, it was the theology of the devil himself that Adam and Eve bit into. That in yourself, in ourselves, we can be as God is. If we don't get this particular point, then almost anything I'm gonna say really won't fully, you won't fully get it. That is the inherent problem of the human race. That we can set our judgment above God and somehow reach a utopian end and not suffer a consequence for it either along the way or eternally, as the case is. That's what's going on. That's why the nations are raging against God right now. That's why the heathen are raging against God. Because it, that inherent sin nature in humanity says, we know what is good. We know what is evil. And we will get to our own utopian end. We will get there our way. We are just as God is. That is the sin nature. But you go farther into the book of Genesis to chapter three, verse 15, and God spoke to Satan himself and says, I'm gonna put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. In other words, there's, there's going to be a seed, a, a generation born into the world, and he will bruise your head and you shall bruise his feet. I'm gonna soon have a people, God said to the devil himself, who will tread your reasonings under their feet. They're going to step on your head, in other words. And they're going to live above this profane thought that humankind in ourselves can be as God is. That we can work this all out. We can be holy. We can actually be as God is. Remember, that is the foundational sin of humankind. We can be as God is. Now remember that. Now eventually in Genesis 12, God drew to himself a man called Abraham through whom this promise would soon be fulfilled. He, he took this man and he told him, he said, I'm gonna make you a blessing. I'm gonna multiply you. I'm gonna make you more than you are. And through you and by the power of God, I'm going to bless the whole world and I'm gonna make your descendants as numerous as the stars. You'll find that in Genesis chapter 12, verse three and Genesis chapter 15, verse five. I'm going to take you, I'm going to bless you. Now, you and I both know that this is fulfilled in the church of Jesus Christ. That ultimately, Abraham was going to have a family, that family was going to birth a nation called Israel, that nation was going to produce a savior, that savior was going to produce a church. And that church is you and I. 
And we are here today as the actual fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham. Thank God that I will do this. I will multiply you. I will bless the world. I will make you more than you are. And, and you know, of course, you know the journey that Abraham took. As we all do, we try to he tried to figure out, how can I help God do this? I'm getting old and like nothing is happening. And he would probably go out at night and look up at the stars and say, wow, this is, these are going to be my descendants. He, he couldn't have a view. He didn't have a view of this. This is not necessarily a, a physical heritage. It's going to be a spiritual heritage that's going to be given you. Abraham, Paul says, is the father of those of us who are saved by faith. Now, how can this happen? Abraham asked God. And in chapter 15 of Genesis in verse 8, he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? And so he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Now, this is only a sidebar. I was looking at it today on the way out in the car, and I said, a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old goat, and a three-year-old ram. Why, why did they have to be three? Why was there three threes? I thought it was interesting that Jesus ministered for three years and died at the age of 33. Everything in the Bible, folks, points to him. He's everywhere. He's in every line. He's in every book. He's in every chapter. Everything points to Jesus Christ. I, I absolutely love this with all of my heart. And then he brought these to him and cut them in two in the middle and placed them each piece opposite the other. And the verse 11 says, when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Verse 17, and it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. To your descendants, I've given this land. And it goes on, the covenant he made with Abraham, which also, of course, included the promise of being a blessing and having descendants, everything that was promised to Abraham. But I want you to notice something in this promise that God, this covenant that God made with Abraham that Abraham's only job in the whole thing, as far as I can see, was to be upright and sincere. That's what God told him to be when he first headed out to, on this journey. And he said, Chase, I'm about to do something. I'm about to show you something. I want you just to chase the vultures away that try to devour this. As the church of Jesus Christ, we, we've got to push the birds away one more time that have come down and tried to rob us of the simplicity of Christ the beauty of the cross, the wondrousness of our relationship with God, the fact that I'm not required to be holy in myself. God has promised to do it in me and transform me from the inside out, not through my victory and my human effort, but through his victory and his promises he makes to me. I love the fact that the scripture says it was a it's different in the New King James, but it says a smoking oven and a burning torch and a sacrifice. And it speaks to me of God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son who was the sacrifice coming down and literally God making a covenant with himself, if I may say it that way. God saying, I am going to do this. This is how humankind is going to be restored to a relationship with me. It's not going to be by human might or by power or by reason. It's going to be by the work that I'm going to do on your behalf. I'm going to draw you back to myself again and do in you what can only be done by the power of God. And all you are required to do is ch chase away the vultures that try to come and take away the beauty of what God has been willing to do for you and for the people that you and I preach to in the ministry that God has given to us. Genesis, this promise goes all the way through the Old Testament. Now when you look at the Old Testament, you'll, you'll see that there's, there's a lot of rules and regulations and laws and such like, but this promise, this, it's like a red thread right from Genesis, right from the time God made the promise to spoke not a promise, but spoke to the devil himself and said, I'm going to have a seed that's going to crush your head. That's that thought that you've sown in humankind that humans can be as God is without a relationship, without a living relationship with God that somehow they can achieve this utopian end. I'm going to have a people that's going to crush that idea. And suddenly all the way through the Old Testament, we see this red thread that it's not something that we do, it's something that God has purposed in his heart to do 
even before the creation of the world. The more you study it, the more you begin to see it. God had already determined to send his son even before creating Adam and Eve. It's something that boggles my mind. It's a mystery. The depth of his love, knowing, knowing he would create someone for friendship and fellowship who would ultimately cause him pain. And yet because of the depth of his love for us, he would still do it. I think we're going to be struck by the love of God when we get to heaven. I think we're going to be dumbfounded by it. I think if we have such a thing as a crown on our heads, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be spontaneous to take it off of our heads and throw it at his feet. And we'll say like Isaiah, I've I heard about you now, but now I've seen you. But now I understand this, this love so deep, so divine, so wondrous, so unsearchable. I now understand why you did what you did. So this promise of his redemption, this promise that he was going to come and do for us what we could not do for ourselves, this thread goes all, this promise of blessing us and multiplying us. And when you see it through the Old Testament, he will always wait. He will never let us put our hand to the plow. Have you ever noticed that? I just came from the Middle East with Pastor Gary and Abraham just tried once to help God. What a mess he made with that. And we're dealing with it today all throughout the Middle East, just thinking I could give God a hand. God says, no, put that away. That, the promise is not going to come through human effort. It's not going to come through anything you try to do. I don't want your help. I don't need a hand from you. Now remember the sin nature that Satan had sown into humankind had us believe that in ourselves we could be as God is. It's so important to know that. He sowed that in. So in order to show the descendants of Abraham that we are not God, he introduced a set of over 600 laws that those who would be godly had to keep. In other words, okay, you think you can be like I am? There's, here's uh, 600 and something things to do. It's all you got to do. I mean, if, if, if you can be like me, if, if, if you can be judges of what is good and evil, if, if you can redeem yourselves, then here, give it a shot to do just these, these things. And you should be able to do that. And it required promises, promises that men would make to God to prove in our own strength we can be godly. Even, even God's own people, when they're, they were being brought out and into the, uh, into the wilderness, ultimately the promised land of the Old Testament, they, they were making promises to God. We promise God we will follow him. We promise God we will serve. And they were sincere, but they couldn't keep it. There's something inside of humanity called a sin nature that makes us fall so short of the glory of God that all of our righteousness are like filthy rags in the sight of God. No one can do it. David the psalmist knew it. He said, God, if you marked iniquities, who could stand? Which one of us? Which one of us here today? If your thoughts were put on the screen in the last week, which one of us would not be on our faces before a holy God asking for God for forgiveness? Which one of us could be holy in ourselves, no matter how hard we try? So God says, okay, I'm going to give you a shot at being God. <laughs> so here's some, here's some rules. You just obey them. You just do them. And, but if you break one, you've broken them all. It proves you are not God nor godly by your own strength. And so you have to go back, make a sacrifice, get all cleaned up and then start all over again and give it another try, give it a new try. And so it created a whole industry around the temple, an industry that was prospering on the failures of people where you could, you could get there, you could buy your dove, you could, if you were poor, you could buy your turtle dove, your goat, your lamb, your, your ram. And you imagine, thank God we don't have to do that. You imagine you go into the temple, you really do want to be godly, but there's no other way than through the system of religion that's now been established to help men to try to figure out, and women, you can't be godly in your own strength. And so they, you pick up a lamb, you go in, the, you, you wash it, the lever, you do all this stuff, the priest takes it, he cuts his throat, it pours the blood out, burns the body, does all the things, and then pronounces you clean, you go back out, you feel so good, you're walking across the street and somebody runs over your feet with their cart. And then out of your mouth comes something you didn't intend on saying. And then you try to turn around, you gotta check your pockets, go back and buy another lamb. The, the, 
the Bible tells us, historians tell us, a river of blood used to come out of the Old Testament. A river of blood. And it created a religion of rigidity, of hypocrisy, of big people, of little people, of discouragement, and ultimately it hated God. You say, wow, that's a strong statement. How can you prove that? Well, they killed him when he came. They hated him. They hated him because he came and exposed their bankruptcy, exposed their inability to be holy, exposed their inability to be godly. Peter the apostle says it was a yoke in Acts 15, 10, which neither we nor our fathers could bear. Paul says in Galatians chapter three and verse 24, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. The law was given to teach us that we are not God. Pray all you want, read all you want, go to church, wear the knees out of your pants. You are not God. You cannot make yourself holy by your own efforts. Now we come to Luke chapter three, the final message of the Old Testament. I know I'm going over a lot of history and time. I'm trying to make this as simple as I can. Luke chapter 3. This is, this is the nail in the coffin of the law. Bang. John the Baptist finally shows up. It's, it's the final, final message. From Genesis to right at this point in history, suddenly the chapter's about to close. The nail's going to be placed in the coffin. God sends a man called John the Baptist. Luke chapter 3, beginning at verse 3. And he went up into all the region around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers, who warned you to free, flee from the wrath to come? Now, that looks like so, ins- it looks like here are people coming out and they, they just want to get baptized. It looks like he's being so mean to them. But what he's identifying is there are people coming out that still have that seed of the serpent in them. Remember, a serpent has no ears. A serpent can't hear. That's why he said, who warned you because you can't hear? You're still trying to be righteous in your own strength. Therefore, he says, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. And therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So here's what John the Baptist is saying. Are you not tired yet of trying to be God? Are you not tired yet of trying to be godly in your own strength and by your own effort and by your own prideful ambition? Are you not sick and tired of trying to be God in your own strength? Don't claim that Abraham is your father because the promise of life was given by faith. And you're not living by faith. You're not serving by faith. Your whole concept of righteousness is in your own works. And so he said to them, don't lay claim to the promise that God gave through Abraham. Because if you either bear the fruit that, that indicates that you really are equal to God or prepare to have the ax touch the root of your tree and be thrown into the fire. It was a phenomenal message. We pass it over sometimes. We don't really mind it. We don't understand the depths of what John was really saying because this was the end of the law. This was the end of the Old Testament. Now, Right on the heels of this moment, somebody steps out of obscurity called Jesus. Remember Luke 2 when he was introduced. He's been 30 years now walking the earth, but now the public time of his ministry has come and he he steps out and it says in verse 21, all the people were being baptized. It came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And when he prayed, the heaven was opened. Now listen to this. The Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved son and in you I am well pleased. 
that which would shut the mouth and crush the head of Satan now has appeared before all exactly as it had been shown to Abraham. You remember the, the burning oven, the torch, and the sacrifice? Remember God just pushing Abraham literally aside and say, just keep the vultures away from the sacrifice? The three elements in that sacrifice. Now we see the same three, the Holy Spirit, the voice of God the Father, and the Son who's about to be sacrificed for the sins of humankind. God, in covenant with himself, came to do something for us that we could not do for ourselves. The new covenant would take the Son of God to a cross where God, through Jesus Christ, would destroy forever the power of the poison that Satan had infused into the minds of Adam and his descendants. And finally, 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 to borrow the words of Martin Luther King Jr., (laughs) Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, free at last from trying to be godly and holy in our own strength. John said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus even prayed, if you get time, go into John 17, 15 to 17 and read his prayers. When he talks about Father I pray that they might be with me where I am, for you have loved me before the foundation of the world. John chapter 19, verse 30, Jesus cries out, it is finished. It's finished. The way back to God has been established. Matthew chapter 27, verses 51 and 52, tells us that the veil was rent. The separation between God and man finally ended. The earth shook. Rocks were split in two. The dead rose up out of their graves. And we're seeing this incredible power. Firstly, mankind, humankind is allowed back into the presence of God. Every obstacle that tries to stop us from this living relationship with God will be shaken by his power inside of us. Every hard place will be broken. Every place of death will have to give way to life. He has come to occupy his temple. Oh, thank God. Ephesians chapter one, Pastor David made mention of it just a little while ago. Let me just find it here in my Bible. Ephesians chapter one, beginning at verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in that which is to come. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Christ triumphed, rose from the dead, sits at the right hand of God in total victory over every name that is named on the earth, every name in heaven, everything that every power that ever will rise every obstruction to the kingdom of God, he sits in absolute victory at the right hand of his father. But the beauty of it all too is in Ephesians 2, 4. But God who is rich in his mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Now, it's amazing. I'm seated with Christ tonight. Do you understand that? I'm already there. That's why Paul said we're more than conquerors. I'm already at the right hand of God. I'm not going there. I'm already there. He is the head. I am part of his body. You can't separate the head from the body. When he ran that race, 
against sin and death and he stretched his head over the line, just like a runner, when he puts his head over the line, he officially has won the race, even though the whole body has not come through. The body has also won because the head has crossed the line. When he was raised from the dead, he destroyed the power of the devil. He destroyed that seed that Satan had planted in humankind that you can be God in yourself. He destroyed it and reconciled us back to himself, not by what we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. He saved us, folks. By his mercy, he saved us. Oh, thank God. I look at my life from heaven's throne backwards, not from earth to heaven. I'm looking back. I encourage myself sometimes. Carter, keep on running. We're already here. And Romans 8, 11 says we are quickened. That means made alive by the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Colossians 2, 10 says you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Praise be to God. This is who we are. Talk about good news. Talk about great joy. Talk about a message for all people. There are no big people, there are no little people, there are no strong ones, no weak ones. The ground is level at the cross. Whosoever will may come. And Paul say in Ephesians, the Lord doesn't choose the mighty, he doesn't choose the noble, he doesn't choose those of royal birth. He takes the nothings, the nobodies, the weak, and raises us up, not by our works, but by his inner working inside of our bodies. He raises us up, he quickens us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we now live, not by making promises to God, but by God's promises to us. That's how we live. Sorry if I'm shouting, but I get excited about this, praise God. And you should get excited about it as well. Your people, when you go back to your churches on Sunday, say, what in heaven's name happened to my pastor? I used to fall asleep during his preaching. Now I feel like I'm being hit by a hurricane in church. Okay, now here's the big question. What about my struggles? Okay, I sit at the right hand of God, but I live on terra firma. And I live with me. You know, I live with... With me, you guys get all, you all get that because you all live with you, so you know what that's all about. And we all know that we struggle. You see, the message I'm preaching tonight is not for the game player. It's for the sincere. It's for the person who wants to walk with God. We are already in Christ, fully accepted, loved with a love that we can't even begin to fathom. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, we either are or we aren't. The Bible declares us as righteous as God is. Isn't that amazing? In Christ, not through the law, not by what we do, not by the number of hours we spend in church, as wonderful as all of that is, that does not make us righteous. We are declared righteous by a judicial act of God through his son, Jesus Christ. And so my, my standing is at the right hand of God in Christ. That's, that's where I am. I'm there tonight. Praise God. I'm there. I am at the right hand of God. So are you. Have you ever thought of that? Either you are or you aren't. Either you have, you're a body without a head or you're, you're connected to the head. And if you are, that means you're in Christ and with Christ and you're already in that place of victory. That's why Paul said we're more than conquerors. The only way you can be more than a conqueror is you know the score before you even go into the game. But my state <laughs> is me. The struggles, my trials, my difficulties. The Puritan writers knew this the best. They understood this concept of standing in state. And basically the way they wrote it, I'll just reiterate it, is that I am saved. I'm in Christ at the right hand of God. Even though I live on the earth, all of my life, God's Holy Spirit and God's promises to me will be lifting up my state in line with my standing all of my life. Paul says, I've, I've not achieved yet, but I'm leaving behind what needs to be left behind and I'm moving towards the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. 
We, we will not be perfected on this side of eternity, obviously, in, in these bodies, but we will be changed as we behold him, as we simply behold his victory, as we behold the, the magnitude of what he has done, as we behold the promises he has made us in this word, and by faith, remember the promise to Abraham was by faith, by faith I believe that I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. By faith, I, I believe that God will give me the power to love my wife as Christ loves the church. By, by faith, I believe that I'll be given the power to, to speak right, to speak true, to be honest. And when I fail, thank God I'm covered. As he's lifting my state all my life in line with my standing. And in John chapter 16, Jesus spoke about the Holy Spirit. In verse 13, he says, when he comes... When the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. And he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Remember, you're connected to the head. He will said, the Holy Spirit will take what I won, and he will show it to you. Let me put it another way. Before the foundation of the world, God foreknew that his son was going to have to die. You find it in the New Testament. He was foreordained to go to the cross before the world was even created. He foreknew it. And the father said to the son, I'm going to paraphrase this as easily as I can. Son, we're going to create mankind in our image and they're going to fail. And the failure is going to require a sacrifice to bring them back to us again so that we will have fellowship with them together for forever. We are so precious to God that the book of Hebrews says that the angels desire to even look into this and they can't fully understand the depth of God's love for us as his people. Now, son, you're gonna to have to trust me. We're gonna to walk together on the earth and you're gonna walk there for 33 years and then at the end of 33 years, they're going to kill you and you're going to be put into the grave. Son, you're gonna to have to trust me that on the third day I'm going to raise you from the dead. I'm going to bring you back to heaven. I'm going to sit you at my right hand and all power and all authority and all dominion will be given you. You will have defeated Satan who will have sowed this seed into mankind created in our image. And the son said to his father, Father, I agree and I will do this thing. But there's one thing I ask of you, that when you raise me from the dead and sit me at the right hand of all power, that everything I get, that those who believe in me, they get it too. They become co-inheritors of the victory that I will win when you raise me from the dead. And you see it all the way through. Now, I'm, I'm landing on the mountaintops of this incredible truth. And Pastor Nick, Pastor Gary will be going into the valleys and they're going to be hitting, going around the corners. They're going to be talking about this. But it is the most incredible truth. You see, I fear somehow that we've come through 2,000 years of history and we may just have lost the message. We may just be preaching something that really isn't good news. It is not bringing great joy to people's hearts. And when we're really not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and when we really don't understand the cross and we don't get the victory, we don't understand the miracle of new birth, we're not talking about the blood, we're not talking about what really matters, then we have to resort to gimmickry in the house of God and entertainment to try to keep the people in because we're not preaching the message. But I can guarantee you when those angels broke through that veil and they started singing glory to God in the highest, on earth peace and goodwill towards me, I guarantee you there wasn't a sleepy person in the crowd. Every great revival has come back to this truth. George Whitfield understood it. John Wesley understood. I can go over names. They just suddenly, just like when Josiah began to rebuild the temple or try to rebuild the testimony of God in the earth and suddenly somebody found the word of God that had been stuck in a corner somewhere. And I think as a church age, we've stuck the word of God somewhere. We lost the message. 
But by God's grace, we are going to start preaching Christ again. By God's grace, we're going to start preaching the victory of God. By God's grace, we're not going to be pushing people to be holy. Christ declares them holy. We're going to be leading them to the promises of God, which is good news, great joy. And it's through all people, young and old and rich and poor and educated and uneducated, those who understand the things of God fully and those who don't even know there's an Old Testament. The hungry heart's going to get the victory. If we're going to have revival, we're going to have it God's way. We're going to start preaching Christ again. The victory of Christ, the promises of Christ, the beauty of Christ, the glory of Christ, the power of Christ. <laughs> Peter said we're given exceeding great and precious promises that by these we become partakers of the divine nature, that new nature of God that's now in us. We become partakers of it by the promises of God, not by human effort. I'm not saying we lay down and vegetate. I'm saying as Abraham had, we have a sincere and an upright heart. We do read our Bibles. We do spend time in prayer, but we understand that everything we have is a gift of God through faith. Not through works. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'm going to close very, very soon. Verse 14, <clears throat> speaking of the children of Israel, says their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to Christ, the veil is taken away. That sense of separation from God is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Another translation of that word is generosity. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The veil is done away. Oh God, thank you. Oh God, oh God. Listen, I know what I'm talking about tonight. I tried to be holy in my own strength. In the early years, I don't know what happens. You seem to know all this when you get saved. And what we get in church. I don't know what happens in church. You know, we just say, okay, God, just like Adam and Eve did, we'll take over from here and we believe we can be godly. Yeah, the, the one who just, we got drive and determination. We'll read more and pray more and do more and travel more and speak more. And we find ourselves under the law before we know it. Coming back to the house of God, repetitively condemned, just as they did in the Old Testament. Oh, God, forgive me. I didn't read enough. Oh, God, forgive me. I didn't speak to that person. Oh, God. And we come in and we just, we get out our snot rag and we, we weep at the altar and we think this is so holy. <laughs> I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. I'm not trying to make fun of it. It's just strange. And we think it's holy. Truth is, we are worthy. Truth is we're made righteous. Truth is we, yes, we do fall short, but we're covered. Thank God. Thank God. When I was a cop, I used to, we used to go into places where people had guns and I would say to my partner, cover me, I'm going in. Or he'd say to me, cover me. I thank God we're covered. We're covered by one who's the best shot in the whole universe. The devil will never get us. He can't condemn us. Can't point a finger at us. Praise be to God, he can shoot the wings off a fly at 500 yards. And our message becomes just like that of the angel in Luke chapter 2, right where we began. Hallelujah. Do not be afraid. I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there's born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who's Christ the Lord. And suddenly there's with the angel. Another translation of the word angel here, by the way, is pastor. So may I just interject your name in there? And suddenly there was with the pastor a multitude. of heavenly people praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. Glory to God. Glory to God for what he has done. You won't have to push your people to evangelism. You'll have to try to rent a facility to handle the people that will be coming into the house of God. You send them out with a song. You send them out with strength. You send them out with a testimony and you don't have to give them a program.
Give them Christ. Give them salvation. Give them the victory. Give them the truth. And watch what God will do. This is the only way this generation will be one now. There's no other way. May our congregations all sing glory to God in the highest. And on earth he has called all men to peace. And he has stretched out his hand to forgive whoever wants to be forgiven. Oh, bless God. As I get older, the gospel gets simpler. And I thank God that having gone full circle, we just end up back at the beginning. A friend of mine said this once. He said, this is, it's so wrong. You finally get this right and you die. And he was right. He died two years later. <laughs> he said, it took me all my life. He said, I, 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 was like, I, was, I was John the Baptist my whole life. I was pounding and beating on everybody that I could, all in the name of God. And finally he failed and couldn't get out of his failure. It needed to be lifted and finally understood that this is a kingdom of grace. Got it right and died. Better late than never. Pastor, I encourage you. Don't be sold short of the victory and don't sell your people short of the victory. Let's get back to preaching Christ. Let's get back to preaching the cross. Let's get back to preaching the promises of God. Let's get back to giving hope to the weak, sight to the blind, strength to those who are bruised in heart, freedom to those who are in prison, deliverance to those who are taken captive. Not by telling them how to unlock your prison door, and such like, but tell them who unlocked it for them. Praise be to God. Bless the Lord. I'd like to take time just to pray for you, and then I'd like us to worship for a minute. You think you can work up a shout tonight? I mean a real one. I mean a heavenly one. <laughs> Let's stand. Father, I thank you tonight, Lord, for these men and these women that you have brought into this house for such a time as this. Who knows but that you were born for such a time as this. And Lord, we thank you tonight for bringing us back to the simplicity of Christ, of the cross, the beauty of our salvation, the glorious promises that you make to give us strength. Thank you, Lord, that you will give us a voice that will call this drug-addicted generation back to Christ. The immoral who hate the way they live but don't know how to get out and are clamoring to make it normal, but in their heart they know it isn't. I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, you give us a message in our pulpits that will reach them, our communities, our neighborhoods. I ask you, God, for a spiritual awakening in this nation, our towns, our churches, Lord, starting in our hearts, Lord. Give us an awakening. Restore our confidence. Renew our joy, Lord. As ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as ambassadors, make us like the angels, Lord. Help us to break through that which is separating us from confidence and joy. Give us the power, God. Give us the power, Lord. Give us the power to stand and preach like we never have before. Give us eyes to see this incredible victory, the wonderful promises of our Savior. God, open our hearts to it. Open our spirit to it, Lord. Help us, Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to call the ignorant, sin, sick masses out of their poverty. The religious who are disheartened and are far, falling farther and farther away from you. Give us the grace to call them home and to put a robe and a ring and shoes on their feet, God Almighty, and to invite them to dance with us in the house of God. Oh, Jesus, Son of God, Son of God, Son of God, Plant these truths so deep in our hearts, Lord. Don't let us put it aside. Don't let us put it away.
Give us the grace, my God, to preach like we've never preached ever in our lifetime. Father, I thank you, Lord. Thank you that we live by your promises to us. We can't make any promises to you. We can't keep them. But God, you can't break any of your promises to us. You cannot fail. All you ask for is faith. And so, Lord, we lift our hearts and our hands to you, God. I want to give an altar call. I feel the Holy Spirit have me do it for every man, every woman. You've lost your confidence and you've lost your joy. Would you just slip out? We'll come. Let's just pray together and we're going to worship together for a little while. Just wherever you are. Pastors, just come. We have nothing to hide. We have nothing to run away from. We've got every reason to run towards the Word of God. Just come. There's nothing to try to hang on to. If you've lost your confidence, you've lost your joy. God will give it back. And I'm going to ask him to give it back a hundredfold. Press down, running together and shaking over. God, we want to go. We want to destroy the devil. We want to step on his head. We want to destroy his work in our towns, our communities, our neighborhoods. God Almighty, we want our feet on his head. We want to teach our people how to destroy his lies. God Almighty, we want to see them escape his snare. We want to live for you, Lord God. We want your victory. We want your victory in a deeper way than we've ever known it before. Oh, Jesus, would you lift your hands and just pray for those that are at the altar. Just pray for them now, out loud. God, we lift our brothers and sisters up to you, Lord. God, we ask you for grace. We ask you for strength for them, for each one, for married couples, for those in ministry, Lord. Give us all strength, God. Give us strength. Give us power. Give us compassion. Give us a desire for truth like we've never known it before. Father, we thank you, God. We thank you with all of our heart tonight. With all of our heart, God, we thank you. With all of our heart, we praise you, Lord. God, thank you for this great simplicity of the cross of Christ. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I'm going to ask people to slip out wherever you are. Find somebody here to pray for and just speak words of life into their ears. Just come and pray. Come on, guys with guys, girls with girls. Slip out. Find somebody here to pray for and speak words of life into them. Speak life. Speak the promises of God. We're going together into this battle. Nobody's going to be left behind. There are going to be no weak players here. Every one of us finding our strength in God. Come on, come in close. Come in close. Find somebody to pray for. Find somebody. There's people at the altar here that need somebody. Find somebody to pray for. Find somebody to pray with. Let's believe God. Let's believe God. Praise be to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for reviving your church. Thank you, God, for reviving your ministry. Thank you for strength, Lord. Thank you for strength. Thank you for your power. Thank you, Lord God, for doing what only you can do. Oh, Jesus, Son of God. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you and we praise you, Lord. We bless you, Lord, for meeting us, God. We bless you for giving us strength. We thank you, Lord, for doing what only you can do. Oh, God, thank you. Oh, God, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, mighty God. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, give him a shout of praise and a shout of victory. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Glory to the name of Jesus. Glory to you, Lord, for what you have done. It's your victory, Lord. It's your cross. Thank you for winning the victory for us, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for what you have done. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to your name, Lord. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Praise be to God one more time. It's his victory. It's his cross. It's his redemption. And by faith, it's mine. By faith, it's mine.